News of the Times. Twisted Tales Tuesdays. Mass poisonings in Victorian England. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we look at a number of mass poisonings that occurred in Victorian England, whether they were accidental or not. We take a look at the Bradford sweet poisonings where eating a small sweet can kill you, the dinner that turned out to be poisonous, killing children with poisonous ice cream, and the worst of all poisonings, the poisoning of beer. We hope you enjoy the show. We start this episode with the infamous Bradford poisonings of 1858. To this day, many parts of England have a thriving market in various hamlets, towns and even larger cities. This custom has been part of English culture for centuries. For any visitors to the UK, we urge you to visit Brick Lane in London to get a real flavour of the vibrancy of this cultural trade. In Bradford in 1858, a market trader went through the normal motions of collecting sweets wholesale from a manufacturer and selling them on his market stall, as was his normal routine. And then deaths and chaos ensued. The Market Sweets Poisonings from the Leeds Times, November 1858. Dreadful Catastrophe at Bradford. A horrible catastrophe befell Bradford on Saturday evening last. Seventeen persons were actually poisoned with arsenic, and a whole population were to some extent in danger of a similar fate. A man named William Hardacre has, it seems, been the owner of a stall near the bottom of the Green Market for the sale of spice, etc., and on Saturday night last, he, as usual, displayed his wares for sale. In the course of that afternoon, Hardacre had been supplied with forty pounds worth of mint lozenges of a large size from a manufacturer of such luxuries residing in Stone Street, Manor Row. Many persons purchased of these, and so it happened that Hardacre himself absorbed one of them. He was soon taken ill, and had eventually to be conveyed home to his residence at North Wing in a cab. His place was then supplied by an assistant named John Edmondson and his brother James Edmondson, and these between them continued to sell the mint lozenges till towards twelve o'clock. They had then disposed of at least four pounds of them, each pound containing about two hundred of the lozenges. Only in one single case did they hear of any complaints being made respecting their quality, and they were then changed for something else, apparently more palatable. In the course of the morning, information of the deaths of some young persons from inexplicable causes was given at the police office, but as no account of the fatal lozenges had then been heard of, this created little surprise or interest. When others, however, of a similar nature began to be reported in the course of the afternoon and the evening, more active inquiries were deemed necessary and Detective Berniston, hearing of the deaths of the two children of Mark Burrens, Whitesmith, Jowett Street, Brick Lane, went thither to make some inquiries, and found that the melancholy tale was indeed too true. Orlando, a fine child, about six years old, and John Henry, nearly two years old, were both dead, whilst Burrens himself and Isaac Tillotson and his wife who had partaken of the lozenges, had also been taken ill. Berniston, having learnt that Burroughs had purchased the lozenges from Ardacre, went immediately to the latter's house, and there learnt that the manufacturer was Joseph Neal, who had simply supplied the order given. 
To kneel, therefore, Berniston went, and was soon informed that he had obtained his material, which he termed Terra Alba, or Daft, from Mr. Hodgson, druggist of Shipley. For our listeners, Daft is known to us as plaster, such as what is used to plaster walls. In Victorian times, Daft was used as a filler in various foodstuffs. Sugar was highly expensive as an imported good. Daft was cheap and was used to bring the cost of goods down. To Shipley, the detective accordingly went, taking Mr. Neal with him. The narrative thus began of this horrible and tragical occurrence we shall give as follows, partly in the evidence of the witnesses and in narrative where further consideration is compatible with necessary clearness. Without anticipating evidence, we may state that when Berniston returned from Shipley, he called upon Mr. Leverett, Chief Constable, and related to him the whole affair, so far as was then known, and the most prompt and precautionary measures were then taken to lessen or avert the evil. Because when known that no less than twelve pounds of arsenic had been mixed into forty pounds worth of lozenges, and that upwards of forty-four pounds of these had been retained among the population, and that one lozenge contained sufficient arsenic to cause death, no one could tell where the evil might stop. The policemen, going on night duty, were ordered to inform all heads of families in all the streets of their various beats. Two bellmen were engaged from around about eleven o'clock at night till the live next morning, sounding the alarm in every street, waking thousands from their slumbers and warning them not to partake of the poisoned articles. This necessary proceeding at midnight suggested to many the tinkling of the death bell in the streets of London during the plague, when the survivors in the death-smitten houses were told to bring out their dead. Mr. Leverett also drew up a bill or placard which Mr. Pawson printed at midnight, and of which the following is a copy. Caution! Whereas several persons have died and many are dangerously ill in this borough and neighbourhood, supposed from the effects of eating peppermint lozenges containing some poisonous substance, which were purchased in Green Market on Saturday night last. All persons, having such lozenges in their possession, are requested immediately to come to this office and bring them any such lozenges. W. M. Leverett, Chief Constable, Borough Police Office in Bradford. These were plentifully placarded not only in the town, but also through the whole of the surrounding district, as well as out of townships. Superintendent Copeland, also of the West Riding Force stationed here, has been unremitting in his endeavours to circulate information and lessen the evil as far as possible, and there can be no doubt that, but for the prompt and decisive measures taken by Mr. Leverett and his staff of detectives and police at the outset, the mortality, frightful as it is, would have been immensely increased. The consternation in the town and neighbourhood, and throughout the outer townships, as may easily be imagined was great. All the medical men in the town were busily engaged, and as report after report of deaths and sickness was given in at the police office, the anxiety of the public to learn how the calamity was extending was intense. Many small parcels of lozenges were handed in during the course of the day, at times by parents whose children were sufferers, and by some who had been sufferers themselves, and these, with the parcels brought away by P. C. Campbell from Hardacre's house, weighed in all about 
£300, leaving £4 unaccounted for, and which no doubt had produced the fatal results. Up to Thursday evening, the number of those reported sick and dangerously ill, or were in a fair way of recovery, was 167 persons. In some cases, whole families had been attacked. That, for instance, of John Swain, bowling back lane, whose six children, with himself and wife, were all laid prostrate. That of Thomas Dixon, Thompson's house in Silsbridge Lane, where five adults were suffering at the same time. That of Mr. Peace, Manchester Road, five of whose family were attacked on Saturday afternoon. How far the tragedy may yet deepen, no one can tell. Many are completely prostrate and in a languid, sinking condition. When at Shipley on Sunday evening, Detective Berniston considered it his duty to take the young man, Goddard, who gave the twelve pounds of arsenic to take to Mr. Neal on Monday the 18th into custody, and he was accordingly placed in the dock of the Borough Court on Monday, when Mr. Leverett briefly stated the case and requested that the prisoner, a respectable-looking young man aged 19, should be remanded till Tuesday. In this sad case, the druggist shop was manned by an inexperienced assistant with three weeks of experience, who incorrectly guessed that the arsenic in a large unmarked jar was the requested daft, and twelve pounds of arsenic were handed over to the sweetmaker for the lozenge mixture. The alerts by the police undoubtedly saved lives, but the final counts of death related to the lozenges were seven adults and thirteen children. Hundreds more were taken seriously ill, and the youngest to die was seventeen months old. Undoubtedly, the converted efforts of policemen going door to door and sending out messages via placard and on the streets helped to save many lives. It could have been much worse. As for the poor young apprentice who had obviously not been trained well, he was thrown in jail because someone had to be made responsible for so many deaths and illnesses. The original market seller, with whom the sweets had started from, became very unwell and was unable to move very much for several months. There was no compensation for him, and he had a terrible time avoiding utmost poverty. Several months later, he was back on the market doing his trade, although he remained enfeebled. From the Manchester Guardian, November 1858, The Poisonings at Bradford In the case of William Hardacre, who sold the poisoned lozenges and ate only a portion of one lozenge, himself paralysis. It was on Thursday reported at the police station that if Mr Hardacre survives the shock, he will remain a helpless cripple for life, entirely deprived of the use of his limbs. If this be not the fate of many of the sufferers, disease and suffering in some other shape is, we understood, sure to be their bitter lot to the end of their days. From the Bradford population poisoning, we turn our attention to a more domestic scene. This small story of a woman making a stew which ends up poisoning others and killing herself in 1830 is an example of the many hundreds of accidental poisonings, or were they, that are found in the papers throughout the decades. From the Northampton Mercury, the 11th of September, 1830, The Poisonous Dinner Mrs Shaw, wife of Thomas Shaw, Mercer and Draper, boiled a leg of mutton for her family in a saucepan, which had some days previously been used to boil arsenic for the purpose of destroying vermin. 
When the dinner was prepared, Mrs. Shaw sent part of the broth to a young man who was unwell and partook of some herself. The Reverend John Hughes, Wesleyan minister, having called in, was invited to dinner, and he and Mr. Shaw sat down and were in the act of eating when Mrs. Shaw was taken suddenly ill, and, as the use previously made of the saucepan in which she had prepared the broth returned to her mind, she desired them to eat no more. The unfortunate woman lingered in great pain until Saturday evening when she expired. We jump to 1888 and the danger of street vendors' ice cream. Poisoned by ice cream. This report from 1888 highlighted the secret hidden dangers of eating the most innocuous of foods in Victorian England. This case, by the death of a girl, demonstrates the constant food threats at the time, especially to vulnerable children. From the London Evening Standard, the 28th of August, 1888, the death of Louisa Fairservice. Dr. Thomas held an inquest yesterday at the St. Pancras Coroner's Court as to the death of Louisa Minnie Fairservice, aged three and a half years, whose parents reside in Meesden Street, Kentish Town. Louisa Fairservice, the mother, stated that the deceased Louisa Fairservice, who was a healthy child some twelve weeks ago, was given a teacup and sent out to buy ice cream from a stall in the street. She brought back some cream and lemon ice cream, some of which witnessed the deceased and two children partook of. The children were taken ill. The two other children, after partaking of the ice cream, were taken with vomiting and pains in the stomach. The following day, the deceased Louisa Fairservice became ill and complained of severe pains in the stomach, and witness took her to Dr. Bennett, who prescribed medicine for the child. Her condition got worse. She afterwards took the girl to the North West London Hospital in Kentish Town Road as an outpatient, after which her condition got worse and she lost flesh besides which a rash came out on her body, which they thought was measles. Witness afterwards called on Dr. Bennett to attend to her daughter, but she got worse and died on Tuesday last. The coroner said that he believed that persons making ice cream with lemon juice used acid. Had the deceased eaten haddock? A juror said that he should like to know whether the deceased had been eating haddocks, because within the last week several persons had been admitted at the hospital suffering from vomiting and a rash on the body like measles, which was supposed to be due to the fact that the fish, before being cured by the vendors, was allowed to become partly decomposed. The mother replied that her daughter had not eaten haddock. Symptoms of lead poisoning. Dr. Bennett said that when he first saw the child, it was suffering from enteric fever and partial paralysis, which showed symptoms of lead poisoning. A juror said that many of the ice cream vendors kept their ices in lead pots, and lead poisoning might have arisen from it. The coroner said that might be so and he believed that other cases similar to this had taken place. If anyone went to the district of Air Street Hill and saw how the ices were made, they would not be likely to eat the ices. It was important that the ices should not be made of milk that had been allowed to get sour, and it was also important that the water should not have been contaminated. Died from exhaustion Dr. Bennett stated that, in his opinion, the death of the deceased had been caused by exhaustion from enteric fever, probably caused by lead poisoning after eating ice cream. There must have been some irritant poison in the ice cream. 
and other children were only saved by vomiting. Last year, he attended over three months a boy who had taken six glasses of ice cream. The inquest verdict. The jury returned a death from exhaustion following enteric fever, probably caused by eating ice cream purchased in the street, and they recommended that the sanitary authorities be called upon to purchase ice cream from street vendors with a view to their being submitted for analysis. The use of lead cookware shows up again and again with stories of partial paralysis. Even with this known issue from 1859, the ice cream was suspected of being made in lead pots 30 years later. From the Worcestershire Chronicle, November 1859, Poisoning by Lead. The house surgeon at the Bradford Infirmary states that at the present time there is in that institution a patient who is suffering from symptoms which beyond question are referable to poisoning by lead. The patient is Charles Sutcliffe, a basket maker. He has lost the use of his hands, but under the treatment adopting, he is improving. It appears that he had been in the habit of eating pork, which had been pickled in a leaden cistern, a mode of pickling said to be commonly adopted by Bradford pork butchers, under the idea that the process is thereby facilitated. The plan, however, is fraught with danger to life. Mr. Graham, in his letter, says the lead is certain to be corroded by the salt used, and though the quantity dissolved may be small, yet poison may thus be insidiously introduced into the system in sufficient quantity to cause very serious effects, as in the present case, which he states is by no means a solitary one. We end this episode with what, for many people, would be the worst type of poisonings, the poisoning of beer. This case from 1900 impacted more than 6,000 people who imbibed arsenic-tainted beer. Once it was understood that then poisonings had come from the beer and investigations were underway, it was discovered that beer production had been tainted with arsenic for decades. The original impact was on heavy beer drinkers, drinkers who stuck to spirits did not seem to have the same effects. From the Dundee Courier, November 1900, Poisoned Beer Scare, Numerous Victims Manchester and Salford authorities report that numerous cases of people suffering from the effects of beer drinking continue to be received. In the majority of the cases, however, people do not require any treatment except to totally abstain from beer drinking. Mr Smelt, the Manchester coroner, has issued a statement warning beer sellers of the risk of attending the selling of beer without first ascertaining whether or not it contains poison. Some hundreds of people were suffering from arsenical poisoning in the district, and this has now been traced to beer. Up to now, it had not been suggested that the brewer or the beer seller was to blame, or had any reason to think that the beer contained any injurious matter, but if beer sellers and publicans continue to sell beer containing arsenic and a death resulted, he, the coroner, would not hesitate to tell a jury that they must consider whether or not it amounted to criminal negligence. All beer was under suspicion, and none should be sold without a guarantee. Analysis for arsenic was a simple matter, and would cost only a few shillings, and, to his, Mr. Smelt's mind, the difference of some publicans and beer sellers was astounding. He hoped authorities would condemn and destroy all beer containing arsenic, 
or any other ingredients injurious to health. And in the same edition, Brewery Employees Ill. Press Association Leeds correspondent learnt yesterday that at a large brewery within 60 miles of the city, nearly the whole of the employees have been down with a mysterious disease believed to be arsenical poisoning, which is attributed to the use of some German glucose. So where did the arsenic in the beer come from? Similar to the use of daft in sweets to lower cost, the problem came with attempts to produce the same beer at a lower cost. Instead of the normal use of barley, malt that was used usually in some beers, this had been replaced with a combination of barley malt and glucose. The glucose itself was made through a chemical process with arsenic being one of the remainder substances from the process. The sweetener remained unfiltered and was sold to beer companies for its brewing. Arsenic was also entered into the beer supply through an alternative method of malted barley. The barley was heated in a kiln with coke or coal as the fuel. If arsenic was present in the fuel, it was deposited onto the barley. The outcome. Beer consumption dropped considerably in the Manchester and Salford areas, but over time went back to normal levels. Although there was much talk of forming legislation, nothing real was done. However, the Manchester and Salford areas did see a big drop in the birth rate in 1901. It is believed that the drop was tied to the beer poisoning in the area. That concludes this episode of Twisted Tales Tuesdays, Mass Poisonings in Victorian England. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe. Our goal is 1,000 subscribers. And with the fantastic support of our wonderful News of the Times community, we are making great progress towards that goal. We upload six days a week. Fridays are a new limited series called Forgotten Fridays, where we explore a snapshot from newspaper articles, advertisements and publications of a time from long ago. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time span of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Sundays are eccentrics as we do an in-depth look at some of the quirky, unusual, notable and bizarre characters from Great Britain, which offers up a rich supply to choose from. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Tuesdays are twisted and usually involve a collection of stories based around a theme, such as stories of matricide or when employers go bad. Wednesdays are wicked in this new series that will explore outrageous organisations, bloody locations and shocking events with a bit of murder and mayhem sprinkled in. From all of us at News of the Times, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News at the Times and I am Robin Coles.